since I'm a lawyer and I talk a lot about laws, I, I just make up for it by being a cartoonist and try to get people as excited about the law and as excited about the future as I am. And it's kind of a boring title to my talk, but um, so I try to make it more interesting. What's it? Law, the next economy, and you, because this is all very, all very relevant to everyone here. And uh, those of you on the sidelines, uh, if I see you hanging upside down to see my cartoons, I'll understand what's happening over there. But so hopefully you, you will enjoy it. But anyway, so a little bit about the law and our economic system. So um, I've drawn a grain mill to represent our current economic system, and this is kind of how things go. This is how you make bread in the current economic and legal system: is you have all these inputs, you have water, land, you have seeds, you have consumers who put in their money, you have workers who put in their labor, and you sprinkle on a little bit of pesticide, and what you have is a company, a bread company, that is driven by a shareholder elected board. Well, they crank that wheel around, and they get money, and over time, the system has worked very well for them. They grow their money, they grow their power, and over time, People have been pretty okay with this because it gives us a couple of things, or it has given us a couple of things that we have felt we needed, which are jobs and food. So anyway, so this has gone on for a little while, and I wish I could see what I'm doing. But anyways, oh, a little bit of legal history. So in the Constitution, there's a concept of freedom of contract, this idea that people shall go forth and form economic relationships with each other and do whatever they want and the government won't intervene. Well, the government, after a while, said, oh, that thing we wrote in that constitution, now we realize that if you just let everybody do whatever they want, things can get a little bit imbalanced. And so we're going to make a few laws. We just need to tighten up a few loose screws in the system so you don't completely exploit everybody. And so we tightened up some screws in the realm of employment law to protect workers from being completely exploited by the system. Uh, we created securities laws to protect the investors who put their money in, uh, consumer protection laws, health and safety laws, uh, zoning laws to ensure that you know, large corporations don't come and pollute our neighborhoods, um, just giving things a little order. And all these little bread companies, you know, they've been able to comply because if you, if you look at where, if you wonder where your food comes from, <laughs> What you'll find out is, over time, they've actually become two very large companies. Those 14 brands that I had right there, those are actually two gigantic corporations. And so they have the economic power to comply with all these laws. But one important thing to note is that all these laws haven't necessarily put us in a great position. This is me about 14 years ago. I used to work for Darden Restaurants as a server at Olive Garden. This is the biggest restaurant chain in the world, full-service restaurant chain. and so. Even though it has half a billion dollars in profits every year, and even though we've tightened up all these screws in the systems to protect everybody, we still didn't have paid sick time. I still only made $2.13 an hour, which is the minimum wage for tipped employees. And so it's just important to note that these laws are very important, but they, necess they haven't necessarily helped the entire situation. So they've also, the whole situation has been leading to this, which we've been talking a lot about, which is the distribution of wealth in our current society, just cranking wealth in that particular direction over time. So a lot of people have just said, well, forget that whole system. We're going to create a new system alongside it. We're going to create all of these local projects, worker cooperatives, food cooperatives, co-housing communities, and it's all going to be great. And so we start to do that. And so we have people like this. Yeah, so you have maybe a group of 400 people in a food desert. They come together. They decide we're going to purchase food collectively uh, and form a food cooperative, maybe we'll use somebody's garage to aggregate the orders and manage everything, we'll all volunteer a little bit of our time, we'll all put in a little bit of our money, and it'll be great. And then they try to crank that wheel around, they try to comply with the laws and run their business, and did you see what happened? There it is, I animated it for you. They can't turn the wheel! The wheel is too hard to turn, why? Because we tightened up those bolts so tight for the large companies that have a tendency to exploit us. So, just to give you an example of the, the ways in which they're unable to turn those, uh, the wheel, so employment laws, they might be violating employment laws, and the reason is they've agreed that everybody's going to volunteer three hours per month. But what they're doing, it's not just that they're buying food. Buying food, you know, grocery shopping, that's the thing we do in the realm of our personal lives, that's fine. Operating a grocery store is a very different type of activity. 
And generally, you can't go and volunteer for a local grocery store because we have employment laws that entitle you to minimum wage and workers' compensation insurance and many other protections. Well, this group is not operating to earn money. They're operating to buy food together, but to the extent that they look like a commercial grocery store, they might have to comply with employment laws. And this has actually been the downfall of some food cooperatives. Um, so they're right in this gray area between personal and commercial. And um, it brings up the question of, are they employees of their own buying club? And just to add a little complexity to it, is to acknowledge we've kind of fractured our lives into these different realms. And when we go and we do things and we work, we do so with different motivations. And those different motivations are subject to different regulations. Maybe you know, when, we, when we do work as an Employers, or you know, we go work for our business, we're called employees. When we do work at home, it's called chores or it's just called life. And when we go and we volunteer for a nonprofit, it's charitable activities and it's legal to volunteer in that context. But a lot of what we want to do in the new economy, we do it because it feeds us, it feeds our communities, it, it makes the world a better place. And it's right in that middle spot. And I just, since this is the Economics of Happiness conference, I thought I'd ask, you know, maybe that's our happy spot, is one where we are doing work that benefits us in all of these multifaceted ways. So well, that's going to be a very complicated legal situation. But anyway, so more on laws. Um, securities laws, which Michael has already fortunately explained to you, so I don't have to. Um, brings up a lot of gray areas because lots of people go and they buy things, they buy cat food. It's very different than going and buying stock in a cat food company where, you know, we're kind of glad these giant companies have to do, you know, some regulatory compliance before they take all our money. But if 30 people put in $1,000 each to start their healthy cat food company, are they buying a security in their own cat food company? And depending on how, what state you're in and how the laws are written, that could actually be a security. That, that could be illegal investment. So, okay, let's see how else are they violating the laws. Well, they're using somebody's garage to store this food. Well, you know, grocery stores have to have washable floors, washable walls. They have to have about four or five different sinks for mops and hand washing and all these things. So they can't comply with health and safety laws. But... You know, they're, again, they're, are they a grocery store? Are they just people shopping together? Something in between. So here's a very current example of how attempts to protect consumers are uh, keeping us from providing for ourselves, which is seed libraries. You know, you can go and get free seeds from seed libraries. You can harvest seeds and donate them back. It's a beautiful thing. There's about 400 of them in the US. They're illegal, and now states are starting to crack down because, well, what if you go to a seed library and you get some seeds and they turn out to not be the seeds they say they are? And what if they haven't been tested for all these potential things that could get mixed in with them? And what if they don't germinate very well? You know, So we've created these laws to protect us, but we're taking them a little too far. So. Uh, oh, my organization's working on this. We just introduced three laws, possibly four, as of, to, of yesterday, uh, to legalize seed libraries. Um, and you can go sign a petition and help us. Thank you. At saveseedsharing.org. And anyways, oh, onward with violating laws. So they're, this uh, grocery cooperative is probably violating zoning laws because they're using someone's garage. And, you know, for the most part, the place where... The places where we live are designed to be little boxes on a hillside made out of ticky-tacky, and you live there. You don't do anything else there. You kind of, you just live there. You don't, you know, transact in business and manufacture things in your home. We have other zones for that. So we've zoned our world. We've fractured our lives again into these different spaces. We have commercial zones where, you know, you have traffic and lots of people exchanging things. You have agricultural zones outside of cities, industrial zones. but. A lot of our goal right now is to relocalize all of that, relocalize production, relocalize agriculture, and trade with one another at a local level. And when you try to do that in your neighborhood, it brings up those gray areas, and you are probably violating the laws. So there, you know, another example is um, growing food in your backyard. It's different than being a full-fledged farmer, but a lot of people want to sell some of the stuff they're growing if you're very successful and you can't eat it all. A lot of people are thinking, well, I'll, I'll just sell it to my neighbors. Well. That violates zoning laws in probably the majority of cities, and some cities are starting to change these things, but, but still, we have a lot of problems. So, I mean, the sum total is that there's a lot of hoops to jump through, and they're good hoops. They protect us in many ways, but to jump through them, you need a heck of a lot of money. So, 
So the Sustainable Economies Law Center, oh, and yeah, and just to kind of sum up where we're at with this whole situation is, basically, we've, we've restricted our ability to use our money, our time and labor, our relationships, our homes, our neighborhoods. What do we have left to work with if we want to create a new economy? It's kind of a messy situation. So Sustainable Economies Law Center is trying to basically bring some of these legal hoops down to earth, which, by the way, is a lot of fun. There are a lot of laws that need to be changed. I encourage everybody to do that, change laws. Um, and some of the strategy is, well, let's create exemptions for small-scale activity, like crowdfunding, for example. Or we created uh, an exemption to allow people to sell food they make at home if it's low-risk food items like bread. Um, but it brings up, oh, oh, and there's our website. Just to encourage you to go to it, you'll see all kinds of strange graphics on there. And it's not your typical lawyer lawyery websites. We've, we've written and passed a lot of laws lately to, to lower these barriers, but there's a huge question, which is, how do we loosen all of these bolts that are so important in protecting us? How do we loosen them without opening floodgates to extraction and destruction? Well, yeah, the answer is, well, we actually just have a flawed economic system, and if we just change a couple little things about the system, then we can work this out. And so the two things to change are who is in control, and who gets the money, just those. And so <laughs> here, here we have a new version of a bread company. Well, this one is actually controlled on a democratic basis by its workers or its consumers or both. And the profits get distributed back to those workers and consumers on the basis of how much they worked or how much they purchased. So, and the wealth recirculates to them. It's not continually, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's not continually growing the wealth for the wealthy. Um, and by the way, that thing that I just described, um, it's democratically elected by workers, it distributes profits back to workers based on their <laughs> patronage. Well, that's called a cooperative. And that word cooperative has a lot of baggage. And so I, I put up this slide. There's just a lot of like knowing laughter in this room. But so here, I want to boil cooperatives down to just two things. Cooperatives are not places where people have long, annoying meetings. Cooperatives are places where money does not buy you power and money does not buy you profits. Money doesn't rule everything in cooperatives. People do. What a revolutionary concept. And they don't continue to grow the wealth of the wealthy. They circulate wealth in our communities. They grow our wealth. So let's compare and contrast these two systems. We have this extractive one designed to generate wealth for shareholders and basically take as much as it possibly can. And then we have this generative system that is designed to provide for us and to protect us and to grow our mutual wealth. And if you compare these two and put them side, to side, by, side by side, that is our legal wedge. That is where we can begin to build a new economic system within new legal structures and create laws that are designed for those structures. You have two separate legal regimes. And you can begin to loosen some of these legal barriers for legal structures that are actually designed to prevent the harm in the first place. So one moral to the story, just to emphasize, is cooperatives. Everybody should know what cooperatives are. We need to grow cooperative literacy in society because we can't change the economy without them, and we can't change the legal system without it. That's the thing that I finally realized is these laws, you know, I couldn't figure out how to change them until I realized we actually just need to change them around a new economic system. So another way of putting it is we need legal structures that form a commons. And David Bollier has a really wonderful quote about what a commons is, and I can't read it because it's right above my head. But basically, it's uh, any arrangement where people come together and decide to manage a resource collectively with regard to equitable access and long-term use. Maybe I've uh, sort of memorized it. But I kind of think that with what's happening in the world right now, we pretty much should manage everything that way. And we should build structures that facilitate commons. And if you're one of those people who's building structures on, based on cooperatives or nonprofits, you're trying to rebuild the commons, you might find that it's a little hard right now, like pushing a ball, a giant rock up a hill. But I want to assure you that I think we're about to get to a tipping point, where we all have a mutual, of under, mutual understanding about why this is important. We have legal structures that are going to begin to support it. We're going to have greater literacy around what these things are. And just these things are going to come together at a tipping point where this is going to start working. And that's where everyone comes in. Um, and one final quote from David Bollier is that we're about to become protagonists in our own lives, I think. <laughs> I just, yeah, 
I just think that's a beautiful thing. It's just that we are all part of this, and the economy is not something that just happens to us. The legal system is not something that just happens to us. It is something that we are all going to be very actively involved in creating. It'll be beautiful. Thanks. Thank you.